Good evening. I'm Juliette Preston. I'm one of the new neurologists here at OHSU. Uh, I have migraine headache and that's why I do this job. I have a strong family uh, history of migraine headache. Any of you with migraine headache? Yeah. How many of you have seen a neurologist for it? All right. How many of you have seen a headache specialist for it? All right, not everyone. All right, so welcome on board. Um, so all the things we're going to cover today, lots of lots of little things. But at the end of the lecture, you should be very familiar with what is a migraine, what is the physiology of a migraine, how we treat it, and what are the options uh, down the line. So first, uh, let's talk about headache by itself. When we look at primary care doctors and the visits some patients go to see primary care physician, always the top 10, headache is always one of the top 10. Every 10 seconds, there's someone who goes to the emergency department with a headache. So pretty common thing. In 2008, 3 million visits were due to a first diagnosis of headache and an additional 2.5 with a secondary diagnosis of headache, meaning I had a pain somewhere else, I had something else, and I also had a headache going to the emergency department. So about 4.4% of all the ER visits were due to headaches. Now if we compare migraine headache versus other diseases in the United States, it's pretty impressive. 8% uh, of patients in the United States have asthma, 9% have diabetes, 12% have migraine headache. And when you will look at the ratio of men to women, it's 3 to 1. So we're unlucky in that regard. So 18% of American women will have migraine headache, 6% of men, and about 10% of children. So it's also finding kids. Now if we look at the age between 30 and 39, one out of four women has a migraine headache. So a lot, a lot of women. If we look at the prevalence of migraine, what are the folks I see in clinic? This is the whole group here. 18 to 49 is usually my people. And as a neurologist, usually we see much older patients, right, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, stroke patient, all of those things are affecting older patients, but not my clinic. If we look at me compared to my friends, everyone is young coming to me. And this is important because when you have migraine headache and you can't work and you can't go to work, it's going to affect the economy because there's a lot of you around. And when they looked at numbers, they found that about 13 billion per year were lost because of patients not showing up to work or having a decreased productivity. And if you look at it on an individual level, it does affect our patient too on an individual level. 59% of our patients miss either a social or a leisure activity. Now, what do we do about that? So we know that we know that it affects our patient, but we need to have a mean of keeping track of that. So we put together, I mean not me, but one of the guru of headache, a questionnaire to see how the headache is impacting your life because maybe two headache months for you is very different than two headache months for me. Maybe I can go to work, maybe you can go to work. And if you keep missing two days a month, boy, you're not going to keep a job, for example. So amidus is something you're going to get every time you come to a headache center and at every visit they're going to keep giving you the questionnaire just to keep in track and see how we're doing. Now, you have headache and you wonder, do you have migraine? There are 200 subtypes of headache in the world. So, let's see. Now, we're not going to go over 200 subtypes, but... Mm -hmm. So, what do we define as a migraine headache? You know, uh, the numbers I mentioned make you feel like it's really, really common, really prevalent, but it is not the most common headache. The most common headache is something called a tension headache. 80% of the population will get a tension headache. What it is a tension headache? It's a mild headache where you can move around. It doesn't affect your function. If any headache becomes moderate to severe, if you don't want to move around, if it's throbbing, it becomes a migraine. Now, I counted my 321st visit at OHSU, and only eight patients had tension headache. Even though 80% of people get tension headache, but because it's not severe, they don't go to the doctor, they don't go to the neurologist, and even less to the headache specialist. Alrighty. Now, migraine can be divided into two groups, episodic versus chronic. Episodic meaning you have a few headaches, less than 14. Chronic meaning you have 15 and above. 
And it's a distinction that's important to us because if you fall into that chronic group, you have more severe headache and your headache are harder to treat. Now, there's something else called migraine aura. What is a migraine aura? It's any neurological symptoms that can happen before your headache or with your headache. They, are, they progress slowly. That's the difference with a stroke. A stroke is a vascular event. There's a clot in my brain, flow doesn't get there, I get a symptoms that look a lot like uh, an aura. I can see, I can move, but that is an abrupt onset. The migraine is always slow. Slowly I feel tingling in my face. Slowly I can move my arm. Slowly my vision becomes different. And usually it's completely reversible. If it is not reversible, it is not a migraine. And what are all the uh, aura that we know of? Visual aura is the most common one. 25% of our headache patients have migraine aura, meaning they cannot see other half of the vision, they get zigzag line, wavy, things like that. Somatosensory is actually pretty common. The patient will come to see me because they have those funny sensation, tingling, numbness, they can feel the arm, the leg, and they freak out because nobody tells them what it is, just an aura meaning a signal in your brain that affects the area that controls sensation. Language aura, not so common. However, if you think about it, when you have a bad headache, they sometimes have difficulty finding a word. You're like, oh, I know what I want to say, but it doesn't come out. If you're trying to read something, you can see the word, but it don't make sense. It's a language aura. And motor aura, out of all of them, is the rarest. So less than 10% of our patients will have it. And it's pretty scary. I can move my arm, I cannot grab the jar. This is a motor aura. And I, I put some pictures of auras, they're all visual. Now, having aura does not necessarily mean that you have headaches afterwards. Migraine is a big umbrella. It covers a lot of different types of phenomenon in the brain. Migraine means to a doctor that is something happening at a neurological level. Your neuron is excited and they're spreading signal. That's what it means. You can have abdominal migraine, like children have uh, abdominal pain. That's not a headache. You can get something called a vestibular migraine. I'm getting nauseous, I'm getting dizzy, I don't have a head pain. Or I can have just an aura without the head pain. But when we use the word migraine, we are telling each other there's something happening at the brain level, some signal being spread through the brain. Now, I have migraine, can I have a higher risk of stroke? Absolutely, if you have migraine with aura. We know that my women less than 40 with migraine with aura, the risk of stroke is multiplied by two. That's a big, big deal. However, if we look at the absolute number of a woman less than 40, her risk of stroke is actually really, really low, 0.001. You multiply that risk by two, still small. You add estrogen therapy, someone taking birth control pill, you multiply that risk by seven. If you smoke, you multiply that risk by nine. So now we're getting a little bit more like, hmm, let's stop smoking. Um, now, we get a lot of patients, and one of the questions is, should I be off my estrogen uh, contraceptive? Should I stop it? Not necessarily. If you get more and more aura, if your aura becoming more and more uncomfortable, more and more complex, then it's a red flag to us. Also, if we looked at all the studies that show the risk between stroke and migraine with aura, all of the, the initial study at least, look at the dose of estrogen, and it was always a high dose, 50 microgram. If you look right now at the American product, you never get uh, estrogen higher than 30 microgram in any of the PL. So we know the initial study that studied the ball rolling on stroke were using much higher estrogen, which we're not doing in the US. And all the subsequent study didn't tell you which estrogen products they were looking at, so we cannot say. So for us, because we see so many young women, we don't take them off the pill. But if things change, then we certainly will. All right. Now, the title of the uh, talk was, Is It All In My Head? I did not come up with that title. But the reason is depression is really, really common in our migraine patients. Now, it is not because they have migraine headache that they are getting depressed. It's we think there is these genes are traveling together because migraine patients are 2.5 higher risk of having uh, depression. And if you treat the depression, if they're happy and they go dance, they still have migraine headache. So we know it is not one causing the other, but they do travel together. 
Now let's talk about what is migraine and where does it come from. I'm a, clearly I was a biology major, so I love that slide, and I'm sure you guys don't, but let's look at it together. So what I have the picture is a brain. So at the bottom here, let me get my cursor, it's a spinal cord, and here we see the brain stem. The brain stem sits in the back of your head. This is a command center of your brain. If that doesn't work, you go into a coma. Let's see. And deep in the brain stem, there are some neurons. When we look at migraine patients, those neurons are hyper excitable compared to someone who doesn't have migraine. Let's say your best friend has the same neuron than you, but they're all sitting nice and quiet, while yours are all excitable. So you need a tiny trigger to get that excitable neuron turn on and signal spreading, while your friend who didn't have an excitable neuron is sitting with a very close neuron and it's much higher, higher dose of a trigger, much bigger stress to turn it on. So start first in the brainstem. And it is genetic, so you can blame your mother. <laughs> so that happened. Then the signal travel with the trigeminal nerve. The trigeminal control all those facial sensations. And it goes to number two here, to the periphery. It really, so there is a release of some peptide, some protein that cause some inflammation at the vessel level. It's not an inflammation because you're sick, it's just a sterile inflammation. So things happen at that level, signals spread around the vessel, and it comes back to the brain. So now we have step three. Now you turn on that little nucleus here. That one is important because it controls the pathway to the neck and shoulder. 60% of our headache patients have neck and shoulder pain. Why? Because that guy gets activated and sends signal down the neck. Then signal goes up to the top of the brain, the first step, which is the worst, because now as it goes along, it's going to turn on the signal and other neurons on the side. Now light hurt, my tummy hurt, I feel nauseous, I don't want to move. And those guys get turned on, turned on, and then it hits the cortex and you get pain everywhere. Why do we need to know that? Because the different treatments we have affect different steps. Um, now let's look at triggers. There was an Atlanta headache doctor who asked almost 2,000 of his patients, tell me about your triggers. And he find something interesting. First of all, 75% of his patients had a known trigger, could tell you that happened and then I had a migraine. And the most common trigger, 80% of the time, was stress. So it is not wine, it is not chocolate, it is not oversleeping, it is stress. Now what can you do at your level? You want to prevent that phase one. You have this activation, you don't want it to turn on and spread. So you want to look at minimizing the stress in your life. It can be physical stress, so you want to sleep well. Because we know if you have a restorative sleep, your brain can fight triggers. People who don't sleep enough, who sleep too much over eight hours, get more headaches. You want to have a healthy habit with your eating, meaning you don't want to skip meal because the brain of a migraine is very sensitive to any drop in sugar. So you want to make sure you keep it nice, steady. You want to look at your workplace, at your family, at your finances, what are the sources of stress and see if you can manage some of them. We have patients who change their job because of how many headaches they were getting. And also you want to look at your physical activity. There was a research that looked at patients exercising only three times a week. So it's not like becoming marathon woman, three times a week. And they compare it head to head with taking a pill for migraine, something called topiramate, Topamax, very famous. Head to head, both group had 50% decrease in the headache uh, frequency. It's huge. 30% of the patient on the medication had to drop out of the study because all of the side effects. Well, nobody dropped out of the group who exercised. So everybody who works through our door, we ask them to exercise. Now what else can you do? You can keep a headache diary. And why? It's to be honest with yourself. Because a lot of headache patients don't like to admit they're having a lot of headaches. Because they don't want to be the sick person. They don't want to be, oh, I'm always complaining. So when they come and see me, they always underplay the number of headaches they have. Knowing how many headache days you have, then we can be more aggressive if we have the true number. Also, you want to look at how much rescue medicine you're using. Tylenol, Excedrin, any medicine you have at home. We should know how many you're using. Because if you use too many, it hurts you. We usually recommend 10 days per month. It changes some of the pathway in your brain if you use too many. Now, are there things you can do that are not medication? Absolutely. If we look at the brain, 
there is something called a mitochondria. It's a little mini engine that produces energy in your brain. The poor migrant patient have a mitochondria that has a low metabolism. So you need to help him. So you need to have enough vitamin B2 and enough coenzyme Q10 so you can create energy out of the food source that you're getting in the oxygen. You can find those supplements in food. If you eat well, you have enough of it. However, sometimes the your transporter in the blood don't transport those vitamins enough, so you need to blast them, and that's when we ask you to take some supplement. Vitamin B2, 400 milligram a day, or divided in two doses. Coenzyme Q10, 300 milligram, up to 600 milligram per day. Coenzyme Q10 can also give you energy in the morning. Out of all the vitamins listed today, it is the most expensive. So if you find it too expensive, it's okay not to do it. Vitamin B2 and the next one, magnesium, is very inexpensive and helpful. So what, what else do we know about the brain? Remember I told you you had a very hyper-excitable neuron? Your cortex is more excitable than your friend? Well, if you're low on magnesium, it's even more excitable. So we ask you, take some magnesium, and it can quiet down the cortex for you. So you'll be less likely to get a migraine. When we admit patients in the hospital, we give them a 1,000 milligram IV of magnesium. We train to stop the signaling. So you are safe taking 400 milligram per day. And you can find it in food and in dark chocolate. So in eating chocolate, you can say you're taking your magnesium. Now, you have a headache, what can you do? Let's look. Acute therapy, meaning stopping the headache, is so very, very important uh, for you to understand it and knowing how to use it. Have patients come to me and say, yes, my medication kind of work. Well, what does it mean kind of work? For us, something that works should give you, uh, you should be pain-free at two hours, and you should sustain that pain-free period for 24 hours. That's why I mean the medication work. And the reason is we're trying to prevent your pathway of going into that step four and staying there all the time. Because you don't want to become a chronic migraine patient. So what do you have to do? You have to take an optimal dose at the onset. An optimal dose meaning if you're taking Tylenol, please take 1,000 milligram of Tylenol and not 200. If you want to use naproxen, again, take 1,000 milligram. If you're using ibuprofen, actually use 400 milligram because studies show that 400 versus 800 are the same. So use a big dose, use a real dose, and hit the headache as soon as possible because, again, you're trying to stop step number two or reverse step number four. Now, what are the other medicines that are not over the counter, the medicine that we give you? Triptans, you know, Imitrex, Maxalt, Ergotamine, like DHE, or anti-inflammatory agent. Triptans, if you recall, every doctor always tells you, take it at the onset of the headache, because it works only at the onset of the headache. Step two and three, it wouldn't work if you take it if you wait longer. However, ergotamine, which were the medication we had prior to the triptan, before the 90s, those medicines can work to step number four, but they're very strong. They have lots of side effects. You feel nauseous. You don't like we don't like to give it to our patient unless they come to the hospital. Then we can give them IVDHE. Anti-inflammatory agent. Actually, strong anti-inflammatory agents like Toradol. Toradol is as effective, as potent as morphine, and it can reverse step four. That's so when you go to the urgent care, they give you a, tor a Toradol shot. Nowhere do we find that opioid helps into breaking headaches. If they give you opioid, all they're doing is putting you to sleep. Now, which drugs should you choose? Imitrex was the first one on the market, so most doctors are familiar with that one, and they will be the ones they're going to give you. But it is not actually the most potent one. Maxalt and Relpax are the most potent one. So if you had to choose, choose those two. And they're fast acting, so they act right away. Punch it. Now, at two hours, you got, let's say, a relief in your pain. You had a bad headache, you took the medicine, and you got a little bit better, not completely better then it's okay to retake the same medicine again at two hours. However, if at two hours you had no effect, you took something, no effect at two hours, there is no point in taking the same medicine again. You should switch medicine. And that's why you should always have two or three different agents at home. Are there different fast-acting triptan, uh, an anti-inflammatory agent, or maybe a slower-acting triptan that lasts longer? And I've listed them. 
In fact, one day, 24 hours, you're still not better? Well, you can call us because we can give you a shot of IM DHE or Toradol. Now, when should you use other routes instead of just taking something orally? Um, the Imitrex injectable was created for people who wake up with a headache. So you wake up with headache, the injectable is the best route for you. It's going to go fast. If you get a lot of nausea, you want to bypass injectable. Again, if you have a lot of nausea, you can do a spray in the nose. 5% of migraine patients don't have a progressive migraine. They have something called a crash migraine, meaning between the onset and the peak optimal pain, it takes a very few uh, minutes. It's not like most patients where it kind of gradually grows. For them, an injectable, again, is nice. So when to come and ask for preventative medicine? So far, all we talked about was how to stop a headache, how to abort a headache. A preventative medicine is considered when you start having more than 10 headache days per month. You reach that 10, you should come and talk to your doctor. Or let's say you don't get 10 headaches per month, but the headache you used to take Tylenol for no longer respond to Tylenol. The headache you took um, Sumatriptan or Maxol no longer respond to that. If the few headaches you have are no longer responding to the medicine you have at home, then maybe we should try your preventative, meaning your headache are getting into that stage four. And the goal of the preventative medicine, of course, is to give you less headaches, to make the medicine work for you now, finally, the rescue medicine, and to prevent you from falling into the other category, that category where you have more than 15 headaches per month. Do you have a choice? Yes, we never run out of choice because we have lots of medication. Um, there are also injections you can try. And there are new devices on the market and you may try as well. We're going to talk through each of them. Like what is a successful preventative medicine? You take a medicine and if at three months you have 50% reduction, the medicine works. If you've been on it for a year and you're not sure if it works, it's not working, so you should be off of it. What happens is, as a headache specialist, I don't see a patient directly. The patient goes to the primary care doctor, they get some medicine on board. Then they go to the neurologist, get even more medicine on board. By the time they come and see me, they're already on three or four medicine at the same time. We don't like to do that, there's no reason. So if you've been on something for a long time and you don't see a 50% improvement, come off of that medicine. What are the most common choice? The standard of care. Everyone should have tried at least a blood pressure medicine at least an anti-seizure medicine and an antidepressant. Why? The blood pressure medicine, not because we think you have high blood pressure, but it does something in the pathway in the brain. You're less likely to fire for the blood pressure medicine. The seizure medicine, what it does is stop those channels from talking, from spreading signal, just like for epilepsy. The antidepressant, again, not because we think you have depression, but when you have an ongoing signal pain, there is an inhibitory pathway, a pathway that comes and tries to stop it. If you're low on serotonin, that pathway doesn't work. And we know patients who have a lot of headache are in a chronically low serotonin state. So that's why we give you antidepressant drug to increase that serotonin level, not to make you happier. Now, we try some medicine. What about blocks? Have any of you tried an occipital nerve block? So occipital nerve block have been around for 50 years. It's not experimental, it's not expensive, it's been around for a long time. All it does is a little bit of a lidocaine and a little bit of steroid in the back of your head. Because what happens in 60% of our headache patients, they get neck and shoulder pain, and that nerve gets agitated. It's a peripheral nerve, which means we can access it by the back, we just show it there. But what it does, it resets some of the symptoms inside the brain. So you reset your central pathway, even though we're doing something at a periphery outside. Uh, Botox, has, how many of you have tried Botox? Nobody too, all right. So I just moved from LA where everybody had tried Botox. <laughs> it's funny to me. All right, so Botox is not a magical product. What it does, it decreases the contraction of muscle, right? You have a lot of pain. Those muscles are very tender. Botox quiets it down. But the other thing it does, you remember in that step two, when you have a release of some protein into the vessel that created that inflammation, it stops the release of those proteins so you get a 50% reduction in headache. When someone would choose that, if they don't want to take a medicine, if the medicine they were taking was affecting the mentation, 
Botox doesn't do that because it doesn't go through your body, it doesn't go through the liver or the kidney, and it doesn't affect your mentation. It certainly make you look different. Now, other things on the market. Has anybody heard of Cephaly, the headband? Anybody tried it? Right. So what the Cephaly headband does is send signal to one of the branch of the trigeminal nerve in the forehead. Again, something peripheral. We're doing something at the periphery, hoping that this, it will change some of the pathway inside the brain. Now, does it have great data behind it? Not really. Everything so far we talked about had, is backed by double-blinded clinical trial. Cephaly didn't do that. It's a company in Europe. They gave for free in France and in Belgium uh, the band to patients. and say, hey, keep it for 40 days, use it for 20 minutes a day, and if after three months you liked it, you can buy it from us. And 54% of the patients bought it. Now, is that a good study? No, because I don't know. Is it placebo? I mean, 54%, I'm not sure. Uh, and the people who didn't like it, who returned it, 22% didn't like it, returned it, they had never turned the machine, or they had turned the machine only for three days. So again, I don't know, did not like it, really did not work, they didn't give it a good try. But it's been approved for migraine since 2014. Do I recommend it to my patient? Not necessarily, because even though it's approved, it is not covered by insurance. So buying something for $300 when you don't, you're not sure if it works, tough one. But it doesn't hurt at least. It doesn't cause irreversible damages or anything. Now, it's something else that may be better. Has anybody heard about that box? Right. It's, uh, so the previous band was uh, electrical signal. This box actually creates uh, a magnetic field. Because you remember migraine is this electrical signal through your cortex. What you're doing with the magnetic field, you're trying to disrupt that signal to stop it. And their study on that was awesome. They create that box and they told patients, when you get a bad migraine with aura, put it behind your head and send two signals to yourself and see if you can break the headache. And the results looked great. The blue mean, yes, it works, and the red was a sham box. It means some people had a box, we didn't have a real signal to it. So it was a real to see if it was placebo or not, and it was much better than placebo, so it worked. Also, it's been approved uh, by the FDA since 2013. So the company liked it so much, now they're doing study to see if they can use it as a preventative. So they're enrolling patients where I was working in LA, where you could get the box for free and try it for three months, 20 minutes, and see if you get less headaches. So that will be probably coming in the market in a few years. I have the box in my room and have tried it on myself. I hate to say it didn't work on me, so. but it didn't hurt again. Um, right. So we, know, we learn a lot, of, a lot of little things. Now, when should you see a doctor about your headache? If your headaches are more frequent, more severe, you know your body best. So if you feel worried, you should see a doctor. If it's affecting your life, of course. And if you've been to the emergency department, we want to keep you away from the emergency department to so come and see us. If you have any neurological symptoms, and if you're older than 50 and never had headaches and started having headaches, please come and see us. Because this is not the normal um, demographic. Now, when should you have a brain scan? Because everyone I meet wants an MRI from me. Of course, MRI doesn't hurt. It's not radiation. So it's not downside to it. But OHC would be very mad at me if I gave an MRI to everyone. So let's see. If you never had a headache and it's the first time you have a bad severe headache and you're a little bit older, yes, you get an MRI. Because I want to make sure there's nothing in your brain. If you have headache with vigorous activity, with exercising, bad headache, or with sexual activity, no matter your age, we'll check your brain and also your vessel in your brain to make sure there's nothing wrong with your vessel. If you tell me it's the worst headache of my life, you bet you're getting yourself an MRI. And if you have anything else, like you're confused, you have weakness, you cannot speak, and that's not something normal for you, that's brand new, we will get an MRI. And if you hit your head, also. <laughs> Now, where can you get good resources? I've put in the handout a bunch of places uh, where they have lots of information as well, because maybe your symptom didn't meet anything that I mentioned, but they have lots of great articles, and some of the articles are written by patients themselves, especially on the ECNET. Do you have any questions for me, guys? Yeah, we're good? Excellent.